Welcome to the Avni Interviews. We're your hosts, Eric Bork and Mikey Taylor. What up? We're the co-founders of Avni, a brand for entrepreneurs and influencers, and today, real estate agents, real estate company owners. Here on the Avni Interviews- Don't we inter- shut my guy down short. Entrepreneur, too. Yes. No, I know. Of course, entrepreneur. Entrepreneur. Our guest today <laughs> is- <laughs> Such a big thing. I can't, I can't miss out on being an entrepreneur. That's no, like, no, that's like the field no, word. No. Put him in the field. That's like the key word. I just don't like limiting people to just being an entrepreneur or an influencer. Yeah. Because you know? if you're not an influencer- I don't know usually, if I'm an influencer yet. I don't have the little asterisk You're getting on there. We're going to talk I, about I that. I actually think you're more of an influencer than you think. <laughs> awesome, All right. man. So really quickly, before we jump in- um. We are launching a couple of collectives. We're doing a, a collective called the Mindshare Collective um, for people that want to stay motivated throughout and focus on their goals throughout 2019. And we're also launching one. Uh, l- look these up on avnidigital.com. Um, Mindshare Collective and also Digital Marketing Collective. That one is going to be for people who are serious about uh, digital marketing. Um, so check those out, avnidigital.com, and I want to intro our guest, Kevion Steerdevant. Did I say that right? Had a little bit of like a Euro flair at the end of it, but I like it, man. <laughs> yeah, but, you know so, I mean? but I want, I'm, I'm bummed you didn't wear the mustache so we could call you Kevion. <laughs> Next time. Okay. Next time. Yeah. So Kev, Kevion is the founder of Case Real Estate. Yes, sir. And he started his own personal development company at the age of 17, and runs a personal development company today, also a real estate company called Case Real Estate. They are on the top, the past two years, top 100 Wall Street Journal real estate brokerages. Is that Teams. correct? Teams. Teams. Yeah. Uh, and that's out of 1.2 million agents. So Got it. they're killing it. Thanks, um, man. Kevion, thanks for being on with us. Dude, I'm stoked. Super stoked. We are stoked. Let's do this. Let's build. So I got a, I'm in like a little group with my, my buddies. Yeah. Drama. Uh, Sean Malto, Brian Atlas, and Paul. It's a and, dope group. Yeah, it's a cool group. We get together every every other Thursday, and it's like a mastermind, like just like bro time where yeah. we kind of grow, right? It's awesome. And drama, this is probably four months now. We start talking, and drama's like, dude, I've got to introduce you to my friend. Yeah. I, I, I think you're just going to hit it off with him, right? And I'm like, yeah, like, dude, introduce me to him. So I think I just texted you. Yep. Right? We ended up on the phone, and before you know it, 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 just to like tell you guys, there's there's certain people that you meet and you just recognize that they're different or special. And Kevion is somebody who I just love talking to. I love being around. So uh, thank you. I'm, I'm, it, it's cool when you have a guest that like we know. Like right. it, it's rad meeting people for the first time. But like when you know somebody, you know how they operate. You're like a genuine fan. It's 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 cool to have them on. So oh one, man, thank I you. appreciate that, dude. It's f- funny for me. Like growing up skateboarding, you know, I got to hang out with some legendary skaters, but. Like I never met you uh, before we actually yeah. did that event, but you're somebody that I knew. I watched both of you guys. You know what I mean. So for me, as somebody who's still very passionate about skateboarding, to get that and just have that combo when Drama told me, it was like, oh, sick, my yeah. Taylor. T- <laughs> yeah, it was cool. Sure. Dude, it was cool. <laughs> you know. So dude, you. So I actually didn't know that you were a skater. Mm-hmm. I heard you on Drama's podcast. I was like, dude, this dude kills it. Yeah. Well, so so bring us back to the beginning. Go to like the early days of uh, Chafee. Oh man, that was the era right there. You know what I mean? That that era really saved my life, I would say, because, you know, for, first of all, like I'm this, I'm the firstborn son of two pretty young parents. My uh, my dad and, and my mom, they met at Wilson High School, East Los Angeles. You know, my dad is, is was, he passed in 2012, but he was uh, German and Mexican. My mom's from the Philippines. And my dad was just like troublemaker, you know, like he got my mom's digits. I remember hearing this story, like he pulled the old, hey, like, can I take a photo of you for my photography class kind of move? And my mom told me on their first date, he hotwired a motorcycle. Like, and she, she, he told her that it was his. And then she later found out like, no, he just stole it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so crazy parents. And they had me, they kind of moved out of East Los Angeles. My dad was just a hustler. And so they moved up to the Bay Area where I was born. I was born in Oakland. My dad was trying to like get out of the mix of the the, the scene or whatever. But um, it kept pulling him back, uh-huh. you know. And I kind of grew up very, not really sure of what, 
my dad was doing to get money. I just knew that like we lived in an okay house, but we went on really crazy trips and he had nice cars and his friends all made a lot of money. Was there any sense of like, this isn't right or he's doing not something. at all. No, no, I was too young. Yeah. You know, I was too young. It was just interesting. Like I remember being five years old, like chilling at my parents' penthouse parties, like at the Mondrian hotel in the Bonaventure hotel. And, um, having a, a very interesting like understanding about what money was uh -huh. because he would come home from these trips and literally bring home like a briefcase full of money and we would have so much money for a few months and then we'd be broke and then he would take off on a trip again <laughs> did you ever know like where that money actually came from i had no idea you never found no, out no he would go on these trips and so he would make me a map of where he would go and he would put these little pins you know, like the Insta pin, <laughs> oh right? And tell me where he was. And like, he was going down to Belize and he was going, and then he was going from like Be Belize to Ohio or something. And then, you know, long story short, we get a, we get a knock on the door and life changes really quick. And we go from really having a lot of freedom to do what we wanted to being on welfare. And I, um, when you got a knock, you mean your dad got locked yeah. up? Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't know that. My mom told me that he was going to uh, fire school to become a fireman. So when we had to drive up north to visit him in a place called Susanville, <laughs> that's why I was talking to him behind a glass because oh, he was around yeah, so much right. smoke, you know. How old were you at this point? Um, I think when he first went away and I was maybe, maybe six or seven. Oh, okay. You know okay. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But... Through, through the kind of struggle of, of how we grew up and my mom just trying to find a way to provide because I had a you know younger brother, younger sister, um, I could have very easily, we, we grew up in, in all over LA from La Puente to Chino, different like kind of lower income areas, very easily could have gone into gangs and dealing drugs um, because of just, it was just a natural thing, right? But a friend of mine skated, had an extra board, and that whole experience, it's so crazy looking back because one friend knew another friend and the other friend knew about Chafee. And in you know sixth grade, we would be taking the bus to Chafee and it was just like this army, yeah. just this like crew of skaters. Yeah. And then even before that though, in the early 90s, my mom, when I was just starting to play around with skateboarding, she's like, hey, you, you know, check this out. And she handed me a cover, a Thrasher cover. And it, she's like, that's my, that's my cousin. So my grandma and uh, my Auntie Mary Lou, they're, they're sisters. My Auntie Mary Lou's son is, his name's Rick Ibaceta. So Rick Ibaceta for like, you know, Real OGs, they know, like, he's a legendary EMB yep. dude, yeah. you know? And so she gave me that Thrasher cover, and that was it. Like, seeing that, it was like, oh, shit. This is sick. Yeah. And uh, first meeting him for the first time, I remember the first time I went up to, to chill with him in SF, and I'd been skating now for maybe two years, and he's like, oh, some friends are coming over. Javante, Mike Carroll, and Chico come over. Wow. And I'm like 13, just like, what? Yeah. You know? Um, and so just, just for anybody that doesn't know that like the younger generation or we got to cue this up, man. The, the, and he, Rick, I would say it was in San Francisco, like at yeah. the hub in Barcadero. Yeah. And then in LA, the main hub was the courthouse, Santa yep. Monica courthouse. And in the Inland Empire, it was Shafee. Yeah. Yeah. And some, some kids may not go that far back or know that but Shafee was the embarcadero of sure. that part of california and it was all over the videos all over the mags it you'd go there and it would be packed with people it would be insane yeah yeah so, i mean everybody would, would come through that spot and so like you know because of one guy i met joey brzezinski mm -hmm. you know back then he was bucky yeah. and then you know richard Mulder, and just like i was like four or five years younger than these dudes but um man just that era that that like now with the movie that just came out yeah. mid nineties, yeah. but that was really yeah. the pinnacle. I, I feel like I really got to experience that. And, you know? and so you're are, are, at this point. Do you want to be a pro skater? One hundred percent. Yeah. Oh yeah. The dream was turn pro and at the very least move to SF and open up a skate shop like FTC. Like that was it. Yeah. Okay. There was nothing else. Okay. And um, really, I kind of like 
I guess you could say the 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 peak. Um, I my dad gets out of prison and I end up having to move to Ohio and living on a farm like a legit 30 40 acre farm with a maybe 30 foot cement pad where I could just try flat ground back How old and are you? forth. I was 14 15 okay. you know like I had just met a g- interesting thing we'll we'll catch up on this story later but in 7th grade right before I left um I met a girl she was my best friend's cousin and her name was Alana right so I didn't see that girl. We'll get back to that story for 10 years because immediately after meeting her, I had to move to Ohio. And I didn't really understand why. It was just like, we're living on this farm. My dad's using a different last name. Gnarly. Yeah, it was gnarly. Yeah. So let's talk about at the age of 17, you started personal development. Where did where did your interest come in and what what were your early influences for personal development? So my earliest influences, even before 17, was like when my dad first went to prison, he would send me um, books, you know, and even though that happened to my dad, he was still my hero, no matter what, you know, and so I remember he would, he would send me books on meditation, he would send me books on um, something called mental calisthenics, Mm -hmm. and I was competing in Castle, California Amateur Skateboard League. Oh, man. And in, in this mental calisthenics book, I'm like 12, 13, it's telling, teaching me literally about the art of visualization and yeah. showing you like if you can see it in your mind and jam it in your mind over and over and over, it'll happen in real life. And I remember I, uh, it was the state championships, like 94 or something, right? I went to Oceanside Skate Park. I went to the, the skate park. It was like Tracker Skate Park or something. And I saw the the park. I drew out the park when I got home. Like, here's the bank. Here's the pyramid. Here's the little bench. Here's this. And I wrote out like little stick figures of what I would be doing at each each yep. piece. You know what I mean? Each part in the park. And had my run. I felt really good about my run. And at the end, when they're like, you know, down to fifth, fourth, third, fourth, you know, second, third, first place or whatever. I don't get called fifth. I don't get called fourth. I don't get called third. I don't get called second. I was like, damn, I didn't even place. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then they called first and they're like, Kevin Sturdivant. You won. Kevin, I was born. But um, that was really my first understanding of like, damn, man, like, because I was okay. I think I, 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 I think my skater friends just kind of liked having me around. Uh, I was kind of like a troublemaker, but I wasn't like at their level. Yeah. I wasn't at like Mulder's level, yeah. you know what I mean? But to w- to win first place like that, it really showed me like, dude, this shit is real. Like yeah. if you really jam it in your mind, um, that was my first exposure to goal setting, uh, mindset. Um, and then when I moved back, fast forward five years, when I moved back to Cali from Ohio, when I left, we were on welfare. And when I came back, my mom had bought a home. She moved to Orange County. Um, she was like making good money. And I'm like, what, are you selling drugs too? You know, like <laughs> what happened? Um, and she showed me this vision board. She got a job at a sales company selling motivational seminars hmm. to real estate agents. And she showed me what that company was teaching her. And she showed me a vision board. And she's like, you know, when you and your brother and your sister went to Ohio, this is what I started doing. And like her vision board showed a home in Orange County. It showed a Land Rover Discovery. It showed us. And it, and I was like, wow, crazy, you know. And so my mom really being an example, like living proof of the law of attraction, mm-hmm. it just things were starting to click. Yet at the same time, I was still being rebellious I wasn't really caring too much about, I was stoked for her, but you know, I'd been raging since I was 12, 13. So I skated, but I always had challenges with like substances and drugs. So it wasn't like, I was like, okay, yeah, great. I'm going to be positive now. I was happy, but at the same time, I was still doing my thing. Yeah. Like I got arrested the first time when I was in seventh grade for hustling and trying to sell trees you know trees yeah i was trying to sell weed in seventh grade and i literally got arrested and handcuffed in seventh grade at ramona junior high 
and handcuffed through the school because I was having an attitude and I think the cops wanted to like use me as an example. And I just remember like, my friends being like, free Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I don't think I was a very smart hustler, you know? I, I miss that gene from my dad. Yeah, <laughs> maybe for the best though, right? Yeah, for sure. Like the whole like, don't get high off your own supply rule. I just like forgot about yeah. that. Okay, yeah. so two, a couple of things I wanna talk about. Let, let's talk about um, how, so you mentioned something about getting sober. Yeah. Um, what was that process like for you? Oh, and man. I know we're probably jumping ahead yeah, right we're here, jumping, but we'll, we'll jump back. We'll jump in like 18 years for oh, sure. Really? Oh, did that, that was that far along. Yeah, I didn't 100% get sober until three years ago. So th oh, when no. you say yeah, I raged from, from 13, literally 13, like I did 12 to 14 years old besides like crack and meth. You know what I mean? I did everything. You oh, I didn't do. know that. Yeah. Okay, so dude, you start your first business at 17 yeah. and you're so what wilding out at the same time. Yeah, wilding out for sure. And what had happened was what kind of made me switch from being this just like punk ass kid, like okay at skating, into DJing, hustling, doing these things, but not like a purpose in my life. Mm -hmm. Like I had the hustler mentality from my dad. You know what I mean? My mom is becoming this super positive person. I grew up listening to hip hop. I just wanted to come up. You know what I mean? I just wanted to make money come up. Yeah. I wasn't trying to like live a purpose driven life. Yeah, it was yeah. like, how do you get paper? Yeah. You know, so I started making good money um, when my son was born. My junior year at Costa Mesa High School, I'm skating, I'm DJing, I'm attempting to sell things very ineffectively. <laughs> 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 and um, I get this news that I'm going to be a father, which was. Dude, it was like unreal. Like at that time, there is nothing scarier that you could possibly imagine at 17 years old. Yeah. And um, I just remember like bawling my eyes out in f when I got this news and just thinking about like, how, like, yeah. what am I gonna do? And most of all, thinking about how am I gonna make money now? Yeah, yep. sure. And the house across the street was, for sale, it had like a Century 21 sign and it's clicking for me. My mom was selling seminars at this motivational real estate company. She knows a bunch of real estate people. I'm like, that's what I'll do. I'll sell real estate. I'm a horrible drug dealer. I need to sell real estate. <laughs> You're a junior at this point. Junior I'm a high junior. School. Did you graduate high school? No. No. Yeah. Um, and I went into the house. I was like, mom, I know what I'm, I've, she's like, what? what? She's, I was like, I'm going to sell real estate. She's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you are gonna be so good. Oh, You're no gonna... way. Oh yeah. Oh, sick. oh yeah. I was expecting yeah, reverse. No, 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 she was stoked. And uh, and then it was like, and uh, also I got some other news. You know, uh, she was like 34, 30, she was probably my age or something that I am now when I gave her that news that she was gonna be a grandparent. Oh wow. You know what I mean? I would beat the shit out of her. <laughs> like, yeah, are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So um, that is, that's when I really, really dove all the way in, dude. Okay. And one year, and I remember it was an interesting turning point. Like it was an interesting weekend. Um, one of my really good friends that we all skated with at, at Chafee, um, rest in peace, Jason, Jason Knight, like really dope skater. He overdosed. Um, I had missed so much school that I was getting kicked out of school. And then I got the news that I was gonna be a, a, a dad, you know what I mean? And I feel like at that point, you just, you sometimes reach these, these crossroads in life where it's like very clear, man, that you gotta make a decision. Yep. Mm -hmm. And my son in getting that news about Eli was definitely a turning point where I was like, all right, I don't wanna fuck around anymore. You know what I mean? I've got to make some changes. So I went to the sales manager of the place where my mom was working. And I was like, hey, what's up? You know, I knew him. He, he kind of like, we had a good rapport. And I was like, look, I know how to sell. You know, give me a shot, man. I, I need to make some money. And he's like, what about school? He's like, oh, yeah, I'm done. Like, he didn't ask me if I graduated. I was like, yeah, I'm done. I'm done. Yeah. And so um, I was like, look, worst case scenario, just you don't even have to pay me for two weeks. Put me on the phone and let me try to sell your guys products or whatever for two weeks. And if I don't sell anything, then you didn't lose anything. In the next two weeks, you don't need to pay me. And they gave me the shot and like, 
Within a year, I was making six figures, and my average commission was 50 bucks. Damn. Yeah. So, wow. like, did you know how to sell prior to that? Or were you just like, I can. I knew how to sell for sure. Like, naturally, I think from my dad, and like, I didn't understand until I saw it all in retrospect, like how I grew up and why I grew up the way I did until uh -huh. later. Like, for example, my freshman year of high school alone, I went to three different schools. Like by the time I was in fourth grade, I'd already been to probably nine schools. Mm -hmm. We literally changed schools every six months. Got it. I went to 17 different schools in I don't know how many different states, and I only made it to 11th grade. So every time I would switch schools, you're the new kid, and you have one of two options, either be the outcast or make some friends. And I just got kind of tired of being the outcast, so I would just randomly like say what's up to people. And that is the foundation of sales, yeah. being mm -hmm. able to connect with people. Um, so the mix of that and wanting to just get paper, yeah, you know. So you're selling, you're selling I'm the selling motivation at this point. Yeah, like, dude, I just found a box at my house of all these cassette tapes of me pitching to agents. Oh no mm. way! It's insane. So what? So how long did you work there? I started there in 1999, and um, I made it all the way up to like selling their highest end product, like a $12,000 um, a year product where I got a $500 commission. And my whole goal was to beat the dude's record. And the dude was actually the son of the founder of this company. He's mm. now a pretty big real estate coach. His name's Tom Ferry. And he sold 30 of these in a month and was making 15,000. And long story short, uh, at the end of, 2002 i matched his record and i um the very next month after that i sold 40 and i made 20 g's in a month the month after that i sold i did 40 again month after that 40 again so i sold 120 people into this coaching program mm. and made 60 g's in a 90 day period and i'm like 21 years old nice. or 20 years old yeah. and i worked there uh left that company march 2003 Okay. And keep it real, I got fired from that company. Oh, you did? March 2003. Wow, yeah. you were wiling out. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Because for sure. you sound like the best sales guy they have. Oh, yeah, for sure. I started showing up late. Uh -huh. I thought I was a shit. Yeah. Um, I thought I could show up whenever I wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm now 20 years old. I had a really dope CLK. You know, I'm doing whatever I want, man. And my best friend at the time is killing it in his company, LRG. So in between working at this real estate training company a uh, few years before that i meet jonas and i'm i'm like hawking these seminars and coaching programs to real estate agents but behind the scenes i'm learning the value of personal development in order to sell like that i had to know the product the product was teaching real estate agents how to break through yeah so i thought it was super cheesy to be honest and i wanted to find a way to flip it to my community and so very quickly, like 17 years old, I was getting this info and I'm like, man, I'm gonna teach this to my group of people because they're never gonna listen to these guys. And the first person who was like, yo, like, can you teach me that stuff? Was Jonas, um, you know, who found right yeah. when he started LRG. And the second person was Richard Mulder. Mm -hmm. Those are the first people who are like, gave me the shot at coaching them and teaching them about affirmations, teaching them about the law of attraction. This is the year 2000, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So, And what were what were some of the, just any specifics that you were into? Like I was into Brian Tracy's Psychology of Achievement. Is there any like that, that stuck Dude, out to I you? Dude, I lived, all of that was my college. So I would have graduated in 2001. Mm -hmm. From 1999 to 2003, my entire life, well, 50% of my life because yeah. the other part was, you know, catching like a Nas show and still mm -hmm. trying to DJ and wilding out. But the during the daytime, call it, my entire life was personal development in the law of attraction. Like I did the Tony Robbins firewalk when I was 17 twice. Nice. So Tony Robbins, another place called Landmark Education was super instrumental. Oh, yeah. To Landmark. Breaking yep. through all the you know, the, the negative conditioning that I, I, I experienced growing up being labeled as a juvenile delinquent. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I, I, of the 17 schools, 50% of those were my fault. So from drugs to getting kicked out of, the, out of schools to getting in trouble 
for for whatever um you develop a story that like well maybe i am a piece of shit was there was there a point where you're going through this as a kid going holy crap i actually am limiting myself like was there like a point where like i I can actually break through to this and have to like work through your childhood and what was kind of instilled on you or do you think like as a kid well like you're 17 at this point, right right like yeah at that point do you feel like you were like for me right my parents were really loving but like my mom was uh always worried right she was always worried about everybody getting hurt or sick or dying right right and that without me even realizing it until i was about 19 20 i didn't i didn't know as prior to that than it that it was having an effect on the decisions Mm. i was making right yeah um maybe you didn't have that but but when i was like dude why do i feel this way why am i making these decisions and i didn't go through the personal development stuff till later this was like late 20s that when, I started going when, through When When I was 18, I had a very strong realization of something that I had been telling myself and caring since I was five years old. It was a statement. And I learned this in Landmark Education. But, you know, something happened where basically, you know, in, in, in I think maybe 87 – Um, because it's, what's interesting about landmark is they'll take you back to the moment where this thing happened and you say this, um, and, and everybody has it. And it's usually between your three to, to, to seven years old, something happens and your brain is so raw that, that you, you tell yourself this thing that you carry with you. And, you know, my dad had taken me to this girl's house in, 87 on Valentine's Day and I knew that was a special day. I was five years old and I knew it was a day that like it was about love and I I knew that it was weird that I was at this other this other girl's house and um, long story short he told me not to tell my mom. This was like right before he he went off to prison but uh, he told me not to tell my mom. My mom asked me where we were. I tell her and I just remember the next day talking to him and he's like, my mom's crying. He's like, look at what you did to your mom. You're a liar. You told me you wouldn't tell her. And I just remember dropping the phone in that moment. I'm five and telling myself I'm worthless. Ugh. Like, and you're, it's so real in that, that moment. Dude, when I went through this seminar and I got present to what I had been trying to cover up, I just started bawling my eyes out because it was so real that I've been carrying this feeling of like I'm worthless and no matter what I did that was why I would always want my clothes to be nice like always try to look dope always try to do good in school try to skate well try to make money it was all to like cover up this inner feeling that I'm worthless and it's like building a mansion on quicksand until I got real with What's really in my core, like what's in my roots, there was no amount of success that I could achieve that wouldn't take me back to that feeling. So oh. through doing a lot of work, um, I was able to chip away and, 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 you know what I mean, realize that that's, that's not real. Yeah. 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 So you go from employee of the month four consecutive times to being fired. That's it. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, what happened after that? Where'd you, where'd you end up? So what's interesting is I didn't think that money would ever end that I was making, you know, and my way of my my education about money was that as soon as you get it, you need to get rid of it before it gets taken away. Huh. So that's, you know, like by the time I had gotten let go of that company from from the year 2000 to 2003, like I had made over half a million bucks or something and I had nothing to show for it. I had a Benz and an apartment that I was renting. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I remember calling a buddy and I'm like, dude, I got fired. He's like, I, they told you that would happen if you kept showing up late. I'm like, I didn't think it would actually happen, <laughs> you know? And anyways, he goes, how much money do you have saved? I was like, dude, I have, en- I have enough to last me like 45 days. He's like, what the hell, dude? <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, it's all good. Forget that company. I'm going to get into real estate. I knew the scripts. I knew how to sell. Forget making this $500 product. Let me make real money. And the challenge is I had a horrible study habits. And March 2003, I get fired. Dude, I don't officially start selling real estate 
until April 2004. Oh, wow. Okay. Full year. Because much. I failed the test that many times. Oh. Like people ask me all the time, how many times have you did you take the test? I never tell anybody. What is it? Dude. <laughs> He's not how many times is it? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck it. So I I passed the tenth the test my seventh time. Okay. Yeah. So wait, you just didn't give Exclusive. a shit? Exclusive. Exclusive. I mean, it doesn't matter now. It doesn't it's like, matter now. Uh, you're crushing. But yeah, man. Um, because back then, this is 2003 to 2004, you scheduled your test. That took 30 days to get your test results. It took 30 days later to get the results back. Yeah. So that's two months. And if you failed, you could make a request for a new date, but that date was going to be 30 days later. So every time I failed, two months yeah. wait. Three, it three. was a three month period, oh, gnarly. So seven times, yeah. you know what I mean? Okay. But when, and then so in that year, what happened was I would, um, I had friends who were in real estate that I would prospect for and drum up business for, and they would pay me to like get leads and they'd give me a cut or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's how I got into the game. And who are you estate. working for at this point? So my first six months, I worked for a buddy of mine named Venny Saucedo in, in the cuts, dude, in Norwalk in Long Beach, knocking doors with this dude. Like I remember, I'm like, dang, this dude is knocking doors in the hood. There was like, a, um, you know, the, the popo bird would be this one time we're out knocking doors and he was like, popo bird, what do they call it? The ghetto bird. The ghetto the bird. bird. Yeah, <laughs> the ghetto bird, dog. The ghetto bird helicopter. <laughs> the I remember bird. we were knocking doors. And <laughs> I'm going to get heat for that. But anyways, um, just hearing the ghetto bird be like, go inside your house. You know, there's da 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 It is not safe to be out. And I'm like, this dude is out here in the streets. But that dude, Venny, I had never seen a hustle like that dude. There'd be two kids walking down the street and he'd hand them a flyer like, hey, you guys, you know, if your parents buy a house from us, you know, I'll buy you a PlayStation. I saw this dude. Yeah, right. Dude, I saw this guy, Venny, get, uh, talk to the, the Verizon dude while he's on the pool. Hey, bro, you know, I'm selling a house over here, da, 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 da. And they go, oh, cool, man. I saw him get the Verizon dude's social security number like literally you know what bro you can buy a house you could be qualified to buy this have you ever gotten qualified i'll get you qualified in an hour get the dude's social security number while he's on the pole have him qualified two hours later this was back in 2004 any everybody yeah. was getting qualified yeah, totally yeah. call verizon dude two hours later next thing i know we're out showing that guy and i'm like this dude is insane. Hustler. So you learn from that. I learned from him. And then six months after that, I'm still failing the test. And I get a call from this dude named Robert. Oh, you're, you don't even have your I license. I don't have my license, now. dude. I keep failing the test. <laughs> oh, shit. I'm making enough just to survive. Yeah. And this dude, his name's Robert Gleiner. He was a top producer at a Coa Banker in Beverly Hills. And he's like, look, dude, I know you're out there prospecting. Why don't you come work with me here and do the same thing? And I'll pay you blah, blah, blah. I was like, I told my homie, hey, dog, like, I appreciate this. I got it. And he, it was cool. And so I worked for that dude for another six months and did the exact same thing, but like ultra high end. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. all five mil No more plus. ghetto bird. No more ghetto yeah. bird. Yeah. And then I finally passed the test, dude. Like I remember I lived downtown LA at the Pegasus building, Six and Flower at the time. And... I was making just enough to get by, which for me at that time was like seven to 10 G's a month. <laughs> Mind you, like, this is the challenge with making money is as you start to make money, your lifestyle, your, your goes lifestyle up. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know? Yeah. And I never learned that yeah. until a few years ago, really. Um, but when I finally passed that test, dude, I had so many brokers who had kind of they knew who I was through being the top salesperson at this other, the other real estate company or whatever, who are like, dude, come, come work for me. And um, I ended up getting a really awesome offer. I told this story on short story long, but I was in Beverly Hills at the time and I got an offer from this dude and it was in San Dimas and he was starting his own Century 21. And I'm like, look, man, like I grew up over there for a little while. I'm out here. And he was like, dude, tell me what it would take to have you help me launch this thing. Before actually getting in real estate, I developed this affirmation because, you know, I was 21 years old. I looked really young. 
I knew I was going to need a really, let me rephrase that. I felt like I was going to need a really dope car to over, to, to help people see that I'm legit. Yeah. So I had two affirmations. One was, I, Kevin Sturdivant, easily and effortlessly attract the perfect pro white 745 LI with tan interior and 22 inch HREs and everything I do, oh, for free, and everything I do allows that to happen, right? I'm, I'm 21 years old. My second affirmation, and this was because I knew when I got into the game, I wasn't gonna see any of these $7,000 checks for a while. I felt like I needed 25 Gs to stay afloat. And so I had a second affirmation was, I, Kevin Sturdivant, easily and effortlessly attract $25,000 and everything I do allows that to happen. I didn't know how or where it would come from. I've just always believed in the law of attraction. So I'm saying this shit, like all of 2004. Every day, every, every day, morning. dude, yep. every day, along with like 50 other affirmations. Yeah. So homie calls me and he's like, you gotta come work with me, dog. I know you'll kill it, blah, blah, blah. He doesn't say dog, he was like a more professional guy, but that's how I heard it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, look, dude, I'm not going over there and he's telling me what it would take. Uh, and the affirmation was in my head. I was like, dude, like, give me a 745 and give me like a $25,000 check and maybe I'll come work in San Dimas. And that was it. Calls me two days later. He's like, what's up? You gonna come work for me yet? And I'm like, dude, I'm not going to San Dimas. I've got some other options. I've been waiting for a year to pass this test. I wanna go big. And he's like, well, you said something while we were on the phone the other day. First of all, I'm not gonna get you a $100,000 car. But what if I did give you a $25,000 check? Would you sign a two-year agreement with me? And mind you, I had not even seen what the residential purchase contract looked like. I'm 21 years old. I haven't even received the license in the mail. I just passed the test like two weeks earlier. And I was like, I don't know. Why? He's like, because I'll do it. I'll tell you right now. And I was like, let's meet. In between the time of us meeting, I came up with like my proposal of how I was gonna get both. Cause like, you know, if I could get both, I could still do deals in the high end area. And we sat down and I remember telling him, and, and look, for people who wanna get into sales, like have your script down. Mm -hmm. That's one of the, the first foundation about sales is you better have your script down packed. That's rule number mm -hmm. one, know the script, don't wing it. So I had a script down. I sat with him. I was like, look, dude, you're a really good friend of mine. I really appreciate the 25,000 and mind you, I'm living check to check at this time to, to even think about getting that sounded crazy to me, but I just felt like I could get both. I was like, here's the deal. I know I'm good for at least 30 deals my first year. If I move over to your area, that's a $500,000 deal. That means I'm gonna do 15 mil in, in volume at least. I'll be able to provide coaching to 10 of your agents. The coaching is worth $1,000 a month. That means I'm, I'm providing $10,000 worth of coaching to your office, right? Each of those agents are gonna add at least one deal to their current production. So that's another 5, 000, uh, 5 million in volume. So you have my 15 million, you have their 60 million, plus $120,000 worth of coaching that I'm giving your, your brokerage? Oh, I think that's worth the seven series to me calls me three days later he's like <laughs> hey dude check your fax machine at my apartment at the pegasus i had a fax machine in my office most kids don't even know what a fax machine is yeah. and it just was like and it said a sale bmw at the top i call him he's like pick your options dude and i just like put a line through every single option <laughs> <laughs> That yeah. is one of the best product uh, stacks i've ever that's heard how that's how i got, a product I got into real estate amazing April 2004, um, with 25 Gs in my account and a brand new seven series. Uh, I had just turned 22 in April 2004. I, I gotta stop you for a second because I, I I feel like there's gonna be a lot of people that hear that that go, dude, that's just crazy though. It was crazy. So it was crazy. Absolutely. So, Looking back, I'm like, if some kid came into my office and tried to give me, I'd be like, what? So what do you think that was? Do you think that was a timing thing? Or do you think you just were believing it I so knew hard? It, dude. I knew I would produce and I did produce. Most most kids, like I've had over a hundred people come through case. They they say they're gonna they're gonna make make it happen in real estate, but they don't. Like, dude, the percentage of people who really do perform and and, and we've we've implemented and created an insane 
program to succeed in real estate, it's been, I'd say 50%, dude. 50% succeed. Through case. That's, that's really good. That's not bad. No. I mean, considering there's an 85% failure rate in yeah. real estate, 85% of people who get their license, their real estate license within 18 months are no longer in the business. Why is that? I think it's a lot harder than people think. I think they lack the real skills to sell. It looks great. So I had selling skills. I've been hustling and understanding the art of selling since I was like 12, 13. Most people, they get into selling their most valuable possession and their first thing, their first thing that they're selling is someone's home, someone's most valuable possession. Whereas I had sold everything, all the all the bad stuff that I had sold. And then I got into selling the motivational stuff. Um, in seventh, eighth grade, I would sell all my old skate products, right? Like I would get wheels, stickers, shirts, boards. I was learning learning the art of selling. But I think that's the number one reason why the breakthrough doesn't occur is they don't have the skills. And sales is, is hard. Sales is hard, yeah, dude. You have to stick with yeah, it. Yeah, and you, you, they, don't, they don't have the understanding that every single no is getting you one step closer to a yes. Yeah. Like you have to understand that everything you're doing, it's going somewhere. If you're so caught up in just the deal right now and you're you're not understanding that just leaving the flyer on someone's door, you're planting seeds, that's why they call it farming. Yeah. That's why it's called farming because it's a process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't see a farmer out in the middle of his fields like, why isn't it happening? The farmer knows. Consistent process, consistent process. And I talk to agents all the time. They're like, yeah, man, I went and knocked 20 doors. I didn't get anything. I'm like, Frustrated. Dude, stop, do, stop yeah. saying that. Yeah. What you did, the process was the magic. Just keep doing that. Yeah, I think that is like so important, so valuable. Yeah. That, that's so true, man. Don't, dis don't get discouraged by something not happening. No. Look at it as you're taking the steps to get you where you're trying to go. Yeah. So you're, so you're working for uh, the new guy in... San Dimas, San dude. Dimas. Yep. And, yeah, it's and funny. you start working for him, you're doing well. Yeah, I mean, it's we. St I start. I knew the scripts. I knew how to get listings right out of the gate. Like week one, I'm getting listings. And your motivational, you're you're motivating his employees at this. So also. I'm motivating his employees at this point now. 2004. I had been coaching the LRG crew and a couple people along the side. So I had been at this point. I'd probably coach on the side, all for free. Mm. Majority of all my personal development stuff was just off the strength, just passion. I'd probably coach like. 300 people up to this point. My mom's friends, kids, again, the LRG crew, Richard Mulder, anybody who was down to like learn this stuff, I was like, I'll speak anywhere. You know, I just really fed off of like giving people this knowledge. And I just felt like it was like, damn, dude, this, this seminar is expensive. So I would go to these seminars and I knew my friends weren't going to pay to go to these seminars. Yeah. So I'm like, let me give it to my friends. Yeah. That's how I felt. Yeah. You know, um, so yeah, dude, it was funny. I remember one of my, and, and he didn't know this was one of my first deals officially with, with my license, but, um, it was Nick Diamond. Oh, no way. Yeah. He hit me up. Um, I was, I knew him. He was really good friends with my uncle Rick. And I knew that he was out looking at cribs with somebody else. And a buddy of mine, Chad shoes actually was like, yo, I know Nick is looking for a crib. And this was literally like one of my first five deals and um yeah i remember showing him his his one of his first cribs and he's like bro this is the one and him and and greg carroll bought it together like fha financing yeah yep. <laughs> you know it's like a seven hundred thousand dollar crib yeah All fast right. forward um fast forward like to 2012 he, nick was very very instrumental in helping us like get case known and giving me my first shot at selling some like much bigger homes in FHA where finance. Where did Case come from? Case came from darkness. What does Case stand for? So Case is an acronym for two things. One is it originally it was like, so to kind of like back up a little bit, right? 2004 to 2007, I'm in the flow. I'm in, I'm, I'm in the grind of real estate. And I had two different identities. I had Kevin Sturdivant, real estate guy, suit and tie, scripts. And then I had Kevion who wears a beanie and chills with the LRG crew and does shrooms and smokes weed and whatever. You know what I mean? And I had like 
alternate personalities. And it made me like sick, dude. And I left real estate in 2007 to pursue a full-blown life coaching company. And I started something called Peace Academy with Greg Carroll. And we rocked with that for two years. And middle of the recession. Oh, yeah. Wasn't cracking. Yeah. yeah. Got back into real estate 2009. Like worst Tough case scenario, dude. In, yeah. But we had just had a newborn. And my son, Kaizen, it was mine and Alana's. Fast forward, the girl, the girl yeah. founder, met her, you know, and um, we had Kaizen together at the end of 2008. In 2009, I was like, so broke, dude. Like living with my mother-in-law in Glendora. And I just had to figure something out financially. And I got back into real estate. And I'm making enough to survive. In 2010, like, in 2011, it was like, if I'm going to do this, like, I want to have some sort of meaning in it. I don't want it to just be like real estate guy anymore. But nothing, but I hadn't shifted yet, but it was there. It was starting to be born. And so in 2011, I'm just running on a freaking treadmill. And for some reason, case just popped up in my head. I was thinking about my dad, I was who was getting really sick at this time. Um, and 2011 also was a year that just rocked me in every way where I had to dig into my soul and figure out like what the hell is going on because my best friend in the world uh, passed away in uh, Memorial Day 2011. You know what I mean? So at the end, like maybe 100 days after that, I'm trying to figure out like what is my deal? Where am I going? Best friend passes, my dad's getting sick, and I'm just trying to search, and I just see Case. And it's like Kevin Andrew Sturdivant was my dad's initials and my initials, and then my firstborn son, Eli. Mm. And that was that was like the start of the shift. Um, my dad passing away in January 2012 threw me over the top. I went from being a, in a very dark space about Jonas for that six months to being very angry in mm -hmm. 2012 and needing to to completely just like shed all the crap that I had been holding on to. And then Alana and I also split up in that season and I had nobody else to blame, dude. It was just like me and wow. like the yeah. mirror and I'm just like, what am I gonna do? And I almost left real estate again. Huh. Because I wasn't succeeding anyways. Yeah. I was just getting by. And I was like, if I'm just going to get by, I might as well do my life coaching thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And my mentor asked me a question. And he says, you know, look, here's the deal. You're good at this thing. You have three kids now. Elijah was 2011. Uh, Elijah was 11. Kaizen was eight. Um, excuse me, three. And Azella was six months old. And I was a mess, dude, honestly, like, just to keep it real, it's like, I did not have it together. And I'm not trying to say I have it together now, but my whole company was was born out of like, just darkness, yeah. man, and a, and a struggle of really wanting to figure shit out and create a better life. But contrast creates clarity. Like, I, I really wanna encourage people, like if you're wrestling with something, Keep looking. Whatever you find depends on what it is you're looking for. You have to know that that struggle is doing something within you that's for the greater good. You just have to trust it and you have to ask the universe. You have to ask God, what do you want me to learn from this? Because for me, going through that darkness, going through that emptiness, going through that loneliness is where I found the clarity. And my mentor asking me that question of, if you can have it anyway, what would your real estate company look like? because I had not been looking at it from that place. I was just trying to survive. So you get what you focus on. I was focusing on survival. What was I getting? Survival. survival. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wasn't getting breakthrough. I wasn't getting inspiration. I was getting exactly what I wanted. Survival, make my Benz payment, have a Breitling, get, be able to get some sushi. I wasn't <laughs> trying to have a legendary life, dude. <laughs> sure. So when Jonas and my dad passed, it was like, what the f are you doing, dog? Yeah. You have three kids. You have nothing to, to show for anything. 
what do you want? And through that, I came up with the idea of Case. I looked at everything that I really disliked, which was everything. Yeah. I hated the product. I hated the company. I hated the people. I just, it was like, I hated myself. And I was like, all right, so if I could have it anyway, instead of leaving, I'm going to make a real estate and personal development company. I'm going to let every, all of my clients know that, hey, I'm here as your real estate agent. But just so you know, I'm also here as your life coach. I have a skill set. If you want to use it, it's here. It's a part of my program. For whatever reason, I have the ability of helping you grow and expand your, your, your life also. And that's just available for you. I'm going to add that to my company. Secondly, I'm going to focus on modern and contemporary and mid-century modern architecture. I had sold one million dollar house in my entire career when I came up with this whole vision, and that was that home was to Jonas in 2009. I'd never sold any other million dollar homes. I'd never sold any mid-century homes. I just loved it, right? So I said, I'm going to sell mid-century and modern, contemporary, and I'm going to focus on luxury homes. And uh, and I'm going to have my own thing. I want to have a team, and I want to be known in the action sports and streetwear community because all up until this time, my streetwear homies, my skate homies, thought I worked at LRG. Mm. Yeah. And my real estate clients were all in lower income areas. Like my average sales price was four or five hundred thousand. I would do the occasional like Nick Diamond deal with the homie. You know what I mean? But other than that, I worked where I grew up. I, were, I grew up in the hood, so I worked in the hood. So, so this vision of what I wanted was completely different. Yeah. yeah. It, it was literally the, the dream. What would the dream be? Well, being able to be myself, being able to wear vans on appointments, being able to rock a beanie if I felt like it, inspiring people and not just being like, hi, I'm a real estate guy, and um, having something that I was proud of. Yeah. Wrote out this vision in 2012, January, literally February 2012. Nick hits me up and he's like, yo, dude, 2011 was like a breakthrough year for Diamond. I'm ready to buy a new crib. I was like, what? What are you thinking? He's like something like modern, mid-century yeah, modern. Right. Swear to God, dude. And Nick was my first $2 million sale. He doesn't know that, I don't think. But I was very nervous doing that first sale. I've done well over a hundred two million dollar plus sales since then. But that was such a groundbreaking experience. The day we actually opened escrow um, was the day my dad passed away. Oh wow! Yeah, it was really it was like a very interesting time. And then him shouting us out like, I remember at our closing party we went to Sushi Roku, and I remember at dinner that night he got his K on insta oh uh, cool yeah and him shouting me out and then me i think i had like 300 followers at that time looking at my insta like what yeah <laughs> kevion tell us about building case you just described kind of the the foundation and how you founded it tell us about how you've built it into what it is today because it's pretty rad to look at what you're doing Thanks, today man. well first of all it started with me figuring myself out it did not start as a team. Like it really started in in 2012. I said, you know what? I want to reach the top of this thing. I had always just been like an okay agent, in my opinion. But I said, you know, in 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 five years, I want to be at, at the top. You know, and there's a certain measure of what that looks like. And the me the number in my mind was 47 million. And ironically, when you close 47. 47, that number came from Jonas, but that's what it takes to make a mill. So in my mind, um, and in, in my heart, I felt like, dang, I got to get to that number. That it, it just was pulling at me, not because I was like coming from a place of greed, but let's keep it real. You're a salesperson. It, 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 it's about making the mill. Yeah. You know what I mean? Nothing yeah. wrong about that. I think some, I've coached a lot of people and I end up coaching a lot of artists as well for some reason, uh, or creatives. And there's a mental block about money. Yeah. Because oh, yeah. we hear so much about um, money's the root of all evil. Money, da, 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 da. and it's like, no, like money's not the, the, the root of all evil. The love of money is can be the root of all evil. To me, I had to change my conversation, my inner dialogue about money, because by just... When I just was making 200, look what happened to me. I 
I went broke at 200. I was wilding out at 200. I got cars repossessed making 200 in the, in, in the early 2000s. Like, whoa, what's going to happen if I really make a, a lot? Yeah. So I had to change my conversation about money and, and shed all these negative thoughts that I had in order to really attract it, in order to truly say, I'm going to make my first million and feel good about that and tell myself, no, I, Kevin Sturdivant, believe that money is a positive energy resource that I will use to improve my life and the lives around me. Meanwhile, my ego's like, yeah, right, dude, you're going to get it. You're going to get rims again. You know what I mean? Blah, blah, blah. But point being, um, that is where Case originally started. It was not a team. It was like, I want to sell modern, mid-century modern. I want to be the best at this thing. I want to get to $47 million. I asked myself the question, what is a fail-proof way that I am going to get to that $47 million close within five years, right? 12, 13, 14, 15. Um, I ended up doing it in four. So in, in four years, I reached that goal. I went from absolutely nothing. I think in the year 2011, I closed $2 million, to closing $47 million individually in 2015, um, and 104 million as a company. Nice. But how did that occur is I came up with my game plan. I came up with what is the fail-proof system to make this happen? And I came up with five things that I would personally have to do to break through and make this happen. Um, Can you share those? Sure. Number one was show up at eight o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Yeah. That's number one. Yep. Show up at eight. In real estate, Dude, it's a it, it is it is a graveyard until like all day actually. But definitely at eight o'clock, realtors don't start showing up till like 10, 30, 11. They look busy for an hour. They take a two hour lunch. Then they do God knows what at the end of the day. And they're like, the day I've had. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I was like, number one, show up at eight. Number two, um, you know, I've always played the numbers game. I'm like, man, I got to talk to 20 new people every single morning by phone. Mm -hmm. Number three is I've got to talk to 10 lead follow. I got to make at least 10 lead follow up contacts. Number four, I got to knock on 50 doors a day. And number five, I need to go to the doors of two hot leads. That was my system in 2012. That's a great, that's, yeah. a really good, that's yeah. very helpful. It, it is numbers. It is a, yep. it is like, and again, I was standing from the place of how do I become the greatest at this? How do I get to the million dollar mark in five years? Yeah. That was the system. That was the model. And 2012 was like, holy crap. It wasn't insane, but I closed 12 million, um, you know, times 2.5%. No, I'm sorry, 10 million. So, you, you know. Two and a half percent. Yeah. yeah. And it was like, oh my gosh. I'm wow. getting closer. I'm yeah. getting closer. And then uh, got wifey back. Thank God. She, nobody else swooped her. Swooped her. <laughs> she waited for me. Thank you, Alana. Thank you, babe. Got married at the end of 2012. And in 2013, I, I, in 2012, I just felt like I had two guardian angels over me. Like I had Jonas and I had my dad and they were just looking out for me. I got lucky. 2013 was like, can I do this again? Boom, I closed 13 million. And I'm still pretty much by myself um, but there was a couple of people just chilling with me. Richard Mulder was doing hill brews at the time. He was he saw what I was doing. He came and joined me. After Richard, Danny Montoya came and joined me also. And so now I have me, Richie, Danny Montoya, and we kind of have this little click. And then this other dude starts to chill. And this other dude starts to chill. And by summer 2014, we had this little click of like eight dudes just kind of chilling with us. And the shift that occurred is we had a girl reach out and it was like, is this gonna change things? And when the girl joined our team, cause we were doing some really funny games. Like I was trying to get these guys to follow my crazy rigorous program. Yo, be here at eight then if you're gonna do this, make these 20 contacts, knock these 50 doors. And so we'd come up with these rules like, well, if you're not here at the eight o'clock meeting, you have to spend the whole rest of your day with the shirt with your shirt off. You know what I mean? Or if you're not here um, by eight o'clock, you're gonna have to sign twirl on the weekend at the, at our open house. <laughs> and it was just kind of crazy. Yeah. yeah. And when the girl joined our team, it was like, dang, we gotta like, gotta, like watch our language. And <laughs> her name was Cherie, and Cherie really kind of made us a legit 
team. We yeah. started to come up with rules. We had to like talk HR. And you can't be having your shirt off in the meetings. And two thousand, we went into 2015 a legit squad, and we closed 104 million at at that at that um, that the end of that first year, and we became like the number one team within KW. Blah blah blah, and really cool stuff started to happen. Man, we get the opportunity to do the agenda trade show. Hmm. Like what? Yeah. This is sick. We built a little like mid-century home and I'm seeing my crew start to get paper. Yeah. You know, I'm seeing my like a lot of people start to make a cool six figures and things just start to occur, you know? Why what do you So we hear a lot about people who want to do something. I have this great idea. I yeah. want to do what do you think is like the main reason that holds people back from actually building something out? And that's a really good question. I heard Stephen Furtick, he's a, he's a pastor in Midwest somewhere. And sorry, Stephen Furtick, you know, I don't know exactly where the church is, but I heard him make this statement and it, it, I think it was really powerful. But he said that people want reputation without repetition they just want the title and they haven't necessarily done the work and invested time into the craft they just want the reputation you know they want to be a rock star without even recording a song they 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 want the shine and they haven't even created any results yet yeah you know instagram has made that real easy instagram has made that real easy i mean there's so many people who and i've had a lot of these people come through uh, our squad and they want to just look like a top producing agent without ever even doing anything. And so w- when you come into something and you haven't even experienced being the student, but you want to come across like you're the master, I think it's going to block your opportunity to be coachable. You know, you're trying to just be the dude, and you haven't spent enough time getting your hands dirty in the craft. And I think that's the biggest thing that that blocks people when you're so focused on where you want to arrive and you're missing out on the opportunity to break through in the process. So you've got this inauthentic way of going about doing things. Um, And it's not real, man. And I think a lot of people are going to be they're going to be in for it in this next season. It's been a nice five years. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. yeah when there's a turn, there's yeah, a shift. Yeah, we'll see something happen. Yeah. There's and a you, shift. You know, I I think I'm going to point this out. We interviewed an actor yesterday, Taylor John Smith. Um, and there's always the survivors, the ones that get through this. Um, mm-hmm. there's always. I love how you pointed out those five things. Yeah. Because um, I've talked about this in some of my uh, past podcasts. I sold to medical offices. Yeah. And I knew if I talked to 15 doctors every day or if I I basically went into 15 offices um, that I targeted and then if I I would talk to five doctors and I would close a minimum of one. Right. There's always that that process like you described. So that's that's definitely a great takeaway is figure out what that is. And then you look at someone like Gary Vee, it's very easy to say like, oh, look, he just did. No, he has this process and we've been watching him do that forever. So have those five things like you described. Yeah. That process is pretty crazy. Right. To, to knock 50 doors, um, have that process, keep going. To, yeah, well, do you think it's a generational thing though? Or is it everybody? We're just seeing it more because of Instagram. Man, I don't know. You know, all I know is that we've experienced a, a we've experienced a lot of that where we kind of open our doors to people to come in and learn the game, and they, you, you know, they're, they they want to be the the top agent, but they're not really willing to do the work. Yep. And when it comes time to being coachable, they lack the ability to really like take the coaching. Cause they already think they're, they're the man, you know? And it's like, no dude, like this is, this is, it, it's like. Some stuff like humble themselves on those. Dude, for sure. And it's like, you think about a plane taking off, right? If a plane is taking off and it's just one degree off, it's going to arrive in a, com- the com- a completely different destination. The job of a coach, my job is to kind of observe what you're doing and be aware if you're on or off. And if you don't care about that insight at, at all, dude, 
I mean, good luck. Like, yeah. you know, but these days I think it's easy to kind of just look like the man, you know, and to look like the girl and just like be be a rock star and you haven't actually done anything. Well, I think that I think that's it. I think that there's a lot of people who have these huge followings, but then to get back to and my bad. I meant to say Taylor that we interviewed because he had that process in acting. He would go to auditions and it was hard work. So I think that it's you can have fame nowadays and yeah. have no process as far as what you're doing and there's really no no point but then you're showing off to this huge following like here's a car, here's a lifestyle yeah. when there's really nothing behind it. And that's why I'm always very careful not to put that ahead. I think that's the trap for, for people. I think the trap is when you make yourself look better than you yeah. are because you make yourself vulnerable to be exposed. Right. And that's harmful to, to the self. Yeah. That's harmful to your integrity, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. So well, um, I think is your brain is telling yourself that you've, you've already made it. So those things that you have to do, that dirty work that you have to do to actually perform, to actually produce something, yep. your brain's like, ah, I've, I've, I've already got this. Exactly. And it's like, Dude. So what are some of the things you do to keep yourself in grind mode when you've, you're doing really well now, Yeah. right? Things you could argue are pretty comfortable. Are there steps you take to continue to be hungry, to continue to call 50, 50 right. uh, leads a day or whatever? Now, I'll tell you, I am more uncomfortable now than I think I've ever been. Oh, so That's what everyone says. That. All, so all of you just said that. Yeah. yeah. Anybody at a I high level, highly, I'll say that. I am so <laughs> glad you just said that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you when I got comfortable. I got comfortable. It is very dangerous. I got comfortable at the end of 2015. Um, and I set seven major goals in 2015. And it was 47 million in personal volume, make the M, buy my dream home, buy my dream car, take my, uh, speak at Mega Camp, which was the big Keller Williams event with 10,000 people. Um, and then take my family on our dream vacation to the motherland, to the yeah. Philippines. And one after the other, boom. I remember when I closed the 47, oh, and then buy, the, buy, buy a stupid watch. You have to do that too, right? <laughs> 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 All these goals, right? Dude, I reached every single one in 2015. Boom, the 47. Um, boom, the M. Boom, the house. We ended up buying back a house that we were renting in 2008. Uh, Angel Cabada, who founded Crew, rented us out this crib in 2008. And then in 2006, and then by 2008, I couldn't even afford to rent it from him. And we ended up buying that house back. Uh, that that same house, you know what I mean? Buying my mentor's car from him, I get invited to speak at the event, Mega Camp, ten thousand people, Austin, Texas. When we landed, the day we got home, um, the car was shipped down to me from Seattle. And what's funny is like, all this stuff is all on my Insta from like ground zero of creating these bootleg flyers in two thousand eleven. It's all there. So like I get so many messages from people like, hey man, how do I join your coaching program? And I'm like, dog, you're in my coaching program, bro. Like I'm giving you everything I can possibly give you. It's all there. Can we go get coffee? Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> but I have given you all that I possibly can. You're in my coaching program. Um, every single thing was reached, dude. And, and I remember being in the Philippines December 15th around there, 2015, and it's crazy because all this stuff is coming up. I was on that Philippines trip around this time, so obviously it was November, but whatever. Um, but there was this photo of there's, there's this private island in the Philippines where you're on an island, and you're on an island on an island that I, I had had on my vision board, except now I'm there in 2015, and I can see... Azella, Kaizen, Eli, and my wife. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, oh my God. And to be honest, I had the weirdest feeling of emptiness. Like I reached all the things I wanted to reach. The very next morning, I got up super, super early before everybody. And I had been sober for about eight months. Um, I woke up super early and I found the closest place I could and I just pounded a beer. I don't, I don't know why. And I got home. And I was like, well, you know, shit, I'm killing it. I could probably smoke smoking weed again. It's no big deal. And then I start smoking weed again. I'm still doing my thing. January, February, March, it catches up to me. And then 
April 29, 2016. It's my assistant's 21st birthday at this time. We go out, we wall out, and my brother, I remember, because I was only smoking, but my brother was holding a Jack and Coke, and for some reason I just grabbed it, I pounded it, and four hours later, I'm in a place by myself that I cannot believe I went to. And that's when it all shifted. And I woke up in the morning, I apologized for my wife, I had to have a real conversation with God, and I had to fully surrender. And it was just interesting that I went to that place where I literally could have risked it all, I could have died, definitely could have OD'd. And I really had to look at my life and say, why in the hell would I go there if I had just reached boom, 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 boom. And so I went back to the seven equities. Mind, body, soul, family, friends, business, and money. I've known this. So let me go through these. Mindset, check. Physical, check. Spiritual, I oh, will just kind of skip that one. Family, check. Social, check. Business, check. Money, check. My equity of spirituality was weak. You know, when you look at a pie graph, which I recommend everybody doing, create a pie graph and put in the equities of mind, body, soul, family, friends, business, and money, and shade it in, and take a look at where you're at in those equities. My spiritual equity was empty. I had no understanding of who my creator was, who God was. I might have called myself a Christian since I was a kid, but what did that mean? Did I have a relationship with God? Did I have a relationship with myself spiritually? No. So I had to realize that all the money that I could ever have wanted, reaching that pinnacle, the home, the status, blah, 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 wasn't worth shit if I didn't have an understanding of, dude, who are you? Yeah. And I started doing work. You know, I, my wife and I really started to, to spend time in the word. I made the commitment to being sober. You know what I mean? Um, but my friend Richard Mulder said something really good the other day. We were at this, this men's retreat in Big Bear, and I forgot who he quoted this from, but it said, you know, the, the, the measure of a man's greatness or the measure of a man's power will be determined by the measure of his surrender. I think the more we're willing to take a look at where are we off versus how many followers do I have, where am I, where am I lacking in terms of like, you know what I mean? More, more we can have an honest look at like, man, where do I need to improve? Where do I need to humble myself? Where do I need coaching? That will determine how far we really, we really go. You know, um, and that's what I started to do in April 2000. Since then, you know, this April will be three years, 100% sober. But um, wasn't easy, dude. That's for Congratulations. sure. Thank no, you. That's yeah, that's it's been a battle. This last year has been a battle for, for it, for sure. Like the devil was like, dude. It's legal now. So let me ask you a question about being sober. Yeah. Is that are is are you the personality type where you have to be a hundred percent sober? Oh yeah. So I learned that. It took me three years because I started trying to get sober right after my dad and Jonas passed, which yeah. was 2012. So from 2012 to 2016, I did these 90 day to six month things to prove that I'm not an addict. Huh. Mm. If I was an addict. Well, then would I be able to go 90 days without it? No. So I'm not an addict. So you would do that, and then, but then it would happen again. Yeah. When my, my counselor said it was like, look, dude, you've been wilding since you were 13. You know, mm -hmm. I, you're 33. Here's the challenge. Or you're 30, right, when I first started. You're like a professional baseball player in terms of raging. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you can bunt for sure. You're, you're a home run hitter, though. You can only bunt so many times before you have that opportunity to hit a grand slam. Like, damn. You know, it yeah. was frustrating though because it was like, well, why not, man? Like, why? But I just had to surrender. And I, I'm a numbers guy. So here's how I started to look at it. So bef before all the other times when I would be raging, you know, my life was like at like, a three or four, maybe a five at the best. And so I'd rage and I'd go all the way to a 10. Cool. So that is a five to six point hike. When I dropped the next day down to a two or a three, well, I was at a five before. That's only a three point drop. My increase 
was five points. So this was making sense. And what happened was as I started to work on myself, I naturally got my life to a seven or eight, seven or eight, things are good. So the times that I raged, I got my little two point jump. And then dropped all the way down. But my dropped all the way to two. Mm -hmm. So now my, my jump is half in comparison to my drop. And it's just not adding up anymore. It's not worth the risk anymore. What do you feel like your life's at right now, level wise? I stay around a seven, eight, dude. I stay around a seven, eight. And when I'm below that, I tell wifey quick. Yeah. Really quick. I recognize it really quick when I'm below a seven and it happens a couple times a week. I'll, I'll be totally straight up. It happens every, almost every single morning. I wake up and I tell myself, today is the day <laughs> you screw this thing up. Really? Yeah. I today's a day like people think i'm like naturally positive or something no man like i have to work on this stuff so 99 percent of my days by the time i open my eyes to the time of being awake for 30 minutes i'm already breaking a sweat mm -hmm. my power hour in the morning is a time for me to create the vibe i don't have a naturally high vibe or at least I don't think I have, or maybe I haven't tapped into that person yet who naturally has that vibe. I have to create it. It takes work. I wake up and I think, oh God, worry, fear, doubt, lack, da, da, da. And so I was talking to somebody earlier who, and he said, how, how do you get yourself into that groove? Uh, it's running and biking for me. So I can't do it at the gym and stuff like that. Running and biking for me has been my thing where I have this time to talk to God, to work through anything that I'm working through. By by minute 30, I'm on. Mm -hmm. It's on. Oh yeah. But it does not happen naturally. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that because people ask me that all the time too. Like, how yeah. are you so natural, ha naturally happy? Yeah. Dude, you have to work for it. Dude, it you have to turn easy. this thing on. Yeah. The, I, I call it putting on my armor. Yeah. You know, and I look at my team all the time because my team knows what I do. And I ask them, you guys break a sweat? Do you guys do it, have any type of prep? To me, it blows my mind that people go into the world. You absorbed all the shit in the world and all the problems. Because if you have real goals, you better be prepared for problems. That's really all being a major goal achiever is, is being a really good person problem solver is being a conqueror of the hurdles so you have to know if you're going to do big things you're going to hit some walls so if you go into the battle and you haven't put any armor on i'm i'm like dang i'm scared for you guys you didn't go through any process did you like write out a list of what you're grateful for and you didn't do nothing you just entered this dang all right kevion give us for the listeners give us you've been studying personal development you're pretty much your whole life yeah so what give the what are some very practical tools maybe something you do in your morning routine a value that you value the most um give, give our listeners a few tools awesome i loved what you said about the five things you have to do yeah. in order to get where you want to go man i would say number one um would be to recognize the lie Right, because we could read all this positive stuff. We could say some awesome affirmations for sure. But go to your core. Go to your core foundation of like, what's that make believe BS limiting doubt belief that you have about yourself and mess with that thing. How do you find that thing? To be honest, I've never I think I've done that as reacting, but mm -hmm. how do you how do you find that thing? Is it just uh journaling or I think everybody knows what uh, I think everybody knows what their limiting beliefs and doubts are. If you if you look for it, you'll find it. Hmm. You know, but I don't think it's a common thing that people say. Well, let me look at where I'm afraid. You don't want to face that. You know what I mean? You don't want to look at where you you've been afraid or what you've been um, resisting. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I would say step one would be acknowledging what you're afraid of acknowledge the limiting belief and talk to somebody about it talk to somebody that you respect and that you look up to like step number one about goal setting and the law of attraction and all this stuff honestly is get a real mentor not a social media mentor guy who like says he's a life coach, but really he like lives at his mom's house and he just wants to charge you 200 bucks a month. You know what I'm saying? Like get a, get a real 
mentor, and it could be an uncle, it could be a family member, but get somebody who like tr- who you know and respect, and share with them where you're feeling like resistance. You know what I mean? Get real with that. Um, step two, man, I would say play ridiculously big, like, and play big about it tonight, right? Meaning. Your one year, your five year goal, how do you know you have five years? What does it take to break through tonight? Like the only thing that's really stopping you from achieving your goal that's in five years in, in one year is some make believe story of why you can't have it in 2019. What would it look like to achieve your highest level of lifestyle in 2019? What does that look like, feel like, taste like, feel like? and jot it down, play ridiculously big, right? So number one, I would say get a coach that actually cares about you. Uh, Number two, as I would say, play ridiculously big. Mm. Number three, as I would say, master your craft. You know, I'm good at like three things and I just kind of stay in that zone. So I think when you commit to doing your craft for five hours a day and nothing else, the magic starts to happen. That, that's what I think too. I yeah. think when you start like those five things you said, when you do those every day, you can't finish the day and not feel like you killed it. If you did those things, there's going to be days. Like I would have days when I was selling uh, cold calling where yeah. I would literally at three o'clock be like, I can't do this more today, but I'd go through and then start over the next day. But even though it was frustrating, you still have that sense of fulfillment that 100%. you killed it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Give yourself credit for actually doing the work. You know, be less caught up about the reward, the trophy, the finish line. You know what I mean? Like, take a look at what's the craft and give yourself credit for just doing the work. Like, I love to this day going out. I, I was knocking doors earlier today in... I'm not going to say it, it's my secret little pocket, but there's a zone and we're out there getting our hands dirty, getting the door slammed in our faces, getting wins, getting losses. Like I feed off of the game itself. So I say, figure out what your game is and just put your head down and do what you can with what you have. Don't worry about till you're verified on Instagram. Don't worry about till you have this investor, this car, this whatever, like it's be, do, have not have, do, be. I think that's where a lot of people could get caught up and get stuck is they think that they're missing something, right? Where if you, you're always gonna be missing something. If you're waiting till you graduate to be, go for that thing, if you're waiting till you get a record deal, if you're waiting, you know what I'm saying? You're mm-hmm. never gonna get there. Focus on who do you need to be, first of all. Number two, what's that, what do you need to do? And it might not always be pretty. And so, be very clear on what is it you want to have. So I have a, this is this is out of the blue here, but I just really resonated with what you said in the sense of I haven't been going hard at my own personal content, mainly because I've been building Avni. Mm-hmm. So you have really good content. I really like your Instagram. It looks really good. Um, so you. how do you approach that? Because that you're building content, you're building you know a brand and a look, but how did you approach that? I just enjoyed it. Like I, until this last, until I've gotten denied from uh, this so-and-so podcast guy and this guy who was like, oh, you don't have enough followers. I was like, (laughs) dude, I got bars. Like take a look at (laughs) my my, my history before you just judge me off my 20 or however many thousand followers. I was like, oh, okay. So there's this whole other game you have to play. I, I, I would never been like, okay, I need to get followers. Okay, I need to get verified. Okay, I need to do this. It was more like, I really came from the place of three things. Inspiring, educating, making people laugh. That yeah. was it. So that was, I just, I wanna, it's a platform. And this is my intention. Inspire, uplift, educate, be funny. You yeah. know what I mean? And that was it. And now, as I'm like, oh, okay, you know, I do podcasts now. And so we'll reach out to people and people will be like, oh, you know, you don't have a, and I'm like, okay, so let me play this game and yeah. like get mm-hmm. more followers, you know, in an authentic way. In an authentic way. Because we know way, a lot yeah. of this stuff is all fronting. Oh, but, yeah. You know what I mean? The amount of people who I've, I've met and then I explore their thing that they do. And it's like, okay, so you came up because you went out and sought out successful people. Okay, awesome. So let me take a look. But what what does you do? What did mm-hmm. you what did you do? You know what I mean? And why and now you're selling me. So let me get this straight. So 
you came up off of successful people and interviewing them. You never officially did something yourself besides that, and now I'm supposed to pay you to do mm -hmm. something's off. Yeah. So what's the bigger purpose? Is it inspiring people or is it making money? Yeah. What's Can your real more? intention? Yeah. And so for me, I know what my real core intention is. I have a business that works. That's yeah. why I look up to people like Gary Vee because he actually he has, has a, a business. I love that too. You guys actually And he's had a business been. for a long time. <laughs> I love that too. Right? Yeah. You yes. have, you've actually created things, sold things, yeah. been successful in in multiple different industries. Yeah. So I'm down for this. Certain people, it's like, what? That was hard yeah. for me too. When you start meeting people on Instagram or whatever, and like you see see what Me and Mikey used to get in big arguments about it. We got huge it. fights. We're not we did like arguments debating because like, it, you, know? you see something like, holy shit, this dude is killing it. Mm. And then you meet them and it's like so deflating. You're like, wait, that's all a facade? And then it happens again. Yeah. And then it happens again. And like yeah. before you know it, you're like, dude, you just take the stance of like, this is all fake. You yeah. know, it's, it sucks. It, well, and I think that's why we really, why we really kind of resonate to more towards Gary because you know he has a full business right. on the side. That like he rarely even tries to promote. It's on right. some whole. It's just it's cool. Yeah, man. And I've given I meet so many people through Instagram. I've given some of them, uh, a lot of them, like probably sixty five percent of my my team people came through Instagram. And so you meet this person and it's like whoa, but then. They they come off like they're this this rock star. So then you give them the shot, and they don't know the first thing about business, man. And they we've had so many things just blown out of proportion because somebody wasn't willing to like take coaching. Like, yo, this does this is not how you do this in the real world. Yeah, I know you're like this mm -hmm. person on social media, mm -hmm. but homie, that is not real. Yeah, these are people's lives at stake yeah. and this is not how this works Ugh. and resisting the coaching because they're a make-believe rock star yeah yeah now you're stuck yeah i think yeah. it's just i think it's just like finding what you're what you're you're you gen who you genuinely are and you know mikey just went through this with he he was posting a skateboard trick every day on instagram yeah and now you know and he even was at the time he was he, he had founded and sold a company you know right but it was like so watching you go through this pro process for the past like year and a half of like putting out content it's like i don't think you've ever like bragged about it or like put it out there in a weird way but i think it's finding what you genuinely the work you do and then putting it out there in the right way so yeah and i and think i really intention. resonate yeah i really resonate with you just basically really trying to go as as to the core of it yeah. and figure out what are you like what what are you trying to be who are you and and that's what i had to do and that's that's really what it was it was like i lost everything that right. i had built and found identity in that yeah. right and i had to go to a place of like the very bottom and try to kill all of the ego that i had left and go well, who am i yeah. what am i supposed to do here what is my and and i think just through that process i really tried to I'm kind of convinced that the more you know about yourself, right, the stronger and more powerful you can be, right? Yeah, absolutely. And if you can recognize any type of weakness, insecurity, and not let it kind of stop you or or roadblock any type of growth, right, the 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 higher you're going to climb, right? Yeah, and absolutely. and that that to me was humbling myself. I right. had to go to like no more ego. Right. What is this? And and dude, I completely resonate to a lot of the things you say. Thanks, man. Yeah. Well, well, we're we're. I think we're similar in that we are seeking like the next level, yeah. right? And we know how it's like new levels, yeah. new devils. And and the moment you think you've got it all figured out, dude, I'm scared to death of ever <laughs> arriving at a place again. Yeah, I saw I've, what happened yeah, to me the I've last felt time it too. Before I'm wrestling more now with how can I improve. How can I be a better father? Mm -hmm. Like if you want to really have a breakthrough, go ask 10 people who you really care about and who really care about you and ask them, hey, can I ask you a question? And I give you permission to be totally and completely honest. And I'll never, I won't ask you to explain your answer. This is your shot. Where do you think I'm full of shit? Yeah. Yeah. Do that's it. A, yeah. Yeah, that's a tough what one. <laughs> second question. What about me bugs you? You want to have a breakthrough? 
Go ask 10 people. I, I promise you, I won't ask you. This is your shot. I won't hold it against you. What about me bugs you? What is the thing you've always wanted to tell me, but I've never given you the space? Dude, you want to break uh, through? That's powerful. Go ask three. Yeah. Go ask yeah. those three quotes. Those are heavy I love ones. that. <laughs> I love that. Uh, uh, all right. Well, one thing that we didn't touch on, uh, let's touch it up real quick, touch on it real quick before we close. Yeah, um, you're working with a lot of big people, man. It's so cool to see what you're doing. Give us a snapshot. Like I just saw, I looked on your Insta. You're with me and me and Olivia, my girlfriend. Watch, um, I, and I, I'm gonna bush this because she watches it more than me. The the girl that's doing on the coast. What's her name? You just oh, post Christina. With, yeah, yeah. That's her new show, right? Yeah. yeah. So just to kind of give you guys a snapshot, Kevion's doing deals with like a lot of really cool people. We just didn't touch on. You're not bragging, but he's doing. He's working with a lot of really. Uh, really cool deals around here. What is, what, why were you, uh, Hank, what's she doing now? So we've developed a, a pretty strong brand in luxury real estate in Southern California. Yeah. And people ask me all the time, do you, do, look, dude, look at a map and just put a circle around the uh, Southern California part. Yes, we work that area. So I don't care, it's a, we've sold mobile homes. And yeah. at the same time, I'm working on like a $35 million deal on the coast as we speak, right? Mm -hmm. If it's a cool person, we're here for you. We'll make it happen. We don't care what it is. Um, but we have developed a very strong name in luxury real estate specifically from Be Beverly Hills to the OC. Um, and yeah, HGTV has just hit us up. They hit us up a lot when she's out wanting to look at listings. We have a very strong presence in a community that Got she's you. looking in, yeah. Newport Beach. And so they always hit us up like, hey, can we come and like do this thing? That's yeah. rad, man. Well, that that's a guy. I wanted to at least give people a snapshot because it's rad. Check out. So let's go over where people can find you. Sure, absolutely. Insta is the best spot. You know, my Instagram is Kevion, K E V I O N. It's just Kevion. You just got that, right? That, that's <laughs> a good yeah. one. Well, it, like, like, Did you have to pay for that? Did no, you get it early? man. Like, I'm OG. You know, like 2010, 2011. 2011 was when I started my Insta. Yeah. 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 You got so, it. So uh, it's funny. Like, once a month, I'll get tagged by some like random hood kid in like the Midwest somewhere. They think. You know, there's like, there's another Kevion out there. It's pretty funny. Yeah. But, um, all right, yeah. man. So check, check Kevion out at, uh, on Instagram at Kevion and then, um, personal case. websites in the works. Finally, man. We okay. got shout out to my dude, to... KP. We got, if you look up my, my legal name, Kevin Sturdivant.com. That's Kevin with two E's, K E V E N Sturdivant.com. Putting a lot on that. Good. And yeah. What, what, awesome. uh, what about somebody who wants to sell a home? Please hit me up, man. I got on Instagram? Goals, dude, holler at me. Yeah, shoot me a comment. Shoot me a DM. It's funny. I've done a lot of... Deals from comments? No. Oh. I haven't done enough. <laughs> like, because our focus, right, is really the coaching stuff. Yeah. Like, that's what I'm more, mostly passionate yeah. about. Um, but my business is real estate. So, yeah, that would be really tight. I love when I ha have a kid who's like, yo, I'm going to buy my house from you in two years. And I'm like stoked let's link up now yeah you know because right. a lot of the deals that i've done especially with my homies in streetwear like across the board we've had the opportunity to work with so many people in skateboarding and streetwear it's a process you know buying and selling like it is a it is a very it could be a 90-day process it could be uh, a five-year process yeah you know so hit us up all right Go ahead, Mike. I was just going to say thank you. Yep. Thanks thank for you. being on, yeah, Kevion. Yeah, it. man. Let's do this. Go check out our boy, Kevion. And Kevion, thank you so much for being on. We appreciate it. Thanks, homies.